Hi everybody, welcome to IndyCar. Uh, sorry I didn't get a chance to broadcast earlier today. It's been a very busy day work-wise. So here it is, a uh, late broadcast. Uh, I'm sorry if I had to wait so long for this. Hopefully you will tune in as you uh, go through the day, maybe watch the recording. Okay, today's subject is divorce. Whether the United Kingdom is a country or whether it's a union, how do we manage to separate Scotland and England in an amicable way and how does that affect things in Europe? Well, I've had a number of interesting contacts over the last few days from people who've discovered documents uh, about the, the Act of Union, about the Treaties of Union, uh, about the, the history of how Scotland's Parliament and England's Parliament worked together, uh, whether there was any kind of constitutional foundation for the UK, and also how the European Union viewed the United Kingdom before, uh, at the time when it was first um, created, and how it views it now, now that we're about uh, to separate from it. So let's start with the history, and the history of the, the Union of England and Scotland is, is fairly well known, but there were two Acts of Union, one in 1707 and one in 1800, and both of these cemented different parts of the Union into place. But the primary Act of Union was really to unify the crowns, that means to, to bring both kingdoms under a single monarch, and the second one was to unify the parliaments so that the parliaments sat together in one place, and in this case that one place was Westminster. Now there is a problem with the Union which most Unionists, and particularly modern day politicians, don't really want to tell you about, and that's quite simple. Originally when England decided to force Scotland, because it did, it forced Scotland into a, a kind of a marriage against its will, if you like, by both threatening its, uh, its nobles with having their lands confiscated, plus a trade blockade, uh, plus a, a blockade of Scotland's colonies and shipping. There was a whole lot of pressure put on Scotland to basically uh, do what the English government wanted to do, which was basically to allow England uh, to rule Scotland. But the way it was done was rather unusual. With the Act of Union negotiated between the uh, the two parliaments was an odd one because what it said was that the, the two kingdoms would be uh, united under one king. It didn't actually say that Scotland or England would be extinguished in the process. So both countries still existed uh, although they were being ruled by one monarch, which was fine in principle. And then they decided that they wanted both of the parliaments to sit together as one collective, which became the Westminster Parliament. But for Scotland to have, at the time I believe they had 35 MPs originally when it started out. England had somewhere around 500. So we were always outnumbered from the beginning. But, and this is the but, when Scotland agreed to join the, the Union, in other words, to agree to this uh, deal, if you want to call it a deal, it was more like a forced marriage, but when it agreed to do it, it was on the uh, understanding, the explicit promise from England, that not only would the Crowns be unified and the Parliament sit together, but this new country, this Great Britain that eventually became known as, was going to have its constitution which would guarantee the rights of everybody in it, including all of the Scots citizens. Now that's the bit that never happened. So what actually happens, or happened, and what is still happening, is that the Scottish Parliament, which is now open in Edinburgh, but it also has MPs at Westminster, was never extinguished. It was suspended for 300 years from sitting in Scotland, but it still sat in Westminster. The, the 59 MPs that we have in Westminster, and I count the Labour and Tory and Lib Dem MPs among them, but that group is the Scottish Parliament as well. All right? The Scottish Parliament exists in both places at the same time. Now, the problem is that... When England created the Acts of Union and signed them, they allowed Scotland to keep its own laws. And those laws, or the law of Scotland, was always separate from England's. So neither country could legislate about the fate of the other. So it wasn't supposed to be allowed, although that's not what happened. England has tried, and, and to some extent succeeded, in overwhelming Scotland using its own force of will and the sheer numbers of people involved. 
England always supposed that it wasn't necessary for Scotland and England to join formally as one country because the Scots cohort at Westminster was always outnumbered and the English MPs felt quite comfortable that they could always control the Scottish uh, Parliament, which is what was sitting in Westminster with them. They knew that they could always outnumber us and therefore if the whole of the Scottish Parliament, that's what we now have, 59 MPs, if all of those MPs decided or were, were elected on a promise of separating from the Union and leaving England, then there would be nothing that the English government could do about that because the Scottish government had decided it no longer wanted the treaty with the English government. The fact that the two crowns were joined was completely irrelevant because that was just the head of state. So the situation we're in at the moment is that for Scotland to leave the Euro uh, to leave the, the the Union with England, we just need to have a vote uh, amongst ourselves to do that. Let's say we, we have a, a referendum to advise the Scottish Government that the people of Scotland in majority want to end the Union, and then we simply take all of our existing MPs and bring them home to Scotland. And if a majority of them want independence and will vote for it, then they will join an assembly with the Scottish Government in Holyrood, which is incidentally still part of the Scottish Government, and then have a or then create the law, the legislation necessary to repeal the Acts of Union in Scottish law. And once the, that's been done, then Scotland can declare independence, it can adopt its own constitution, and it can do all of those things at any point it wishes. And not only that, but there would be nothing that the English government could do to stop it because they never legislated for it. They never gave a constitution which bound Scotland to England in perpetuity. It wasn't done. So Scotland has always been free to leave at any point. It's just always been overwhelmed by English votes in Parliament. So the st stage we're at at the moment is that we have an opportunity to leave and there is a good reason for us to leave if Brexit continues to cause the havoc that it's doing. And even if Brexit doesn't happen, it's still driving people towards the idea of separating from England again and going back to running our own business, uh, as we see fit, from our own government in, in Edinburgh. And there's nothing to say that we can't do that. Now, there's another issue. Somebody came up with an interesting uh, piece of history, which I need to check into, but basically what the history said was that um, the European Union regards Scotland and England as separate entities but acting as one country. So in other words, we're a kind of pseudo country because we don't have a constitution. And this is evident from, um, from documents which appear in a museum in the Netherlands. And these documents regard Scotland as a felicit felicitatious, uh, what would you say, a felicitatious union of the kingdoms of both Scotland and England acting together. So in other words, it's two countries acting together as a whole, but not specifically a country. And what that means, if you look at it from a legal sense, is that although the UK government acts for Scotland and England at international level, if Scotland and England were to separate whilst they are still both members of the European Union, the, under European Union laws, each one of those countries would be entitled to exactly 50% of the foreign assets that, that the United Kingdom owns in the European Union, because each country is an equal party to the Union, regardless of the size of their populations and regardless of their GDP or their loans or whatever else. The fact is the two countries are in an equal union on equal footing. So according to European law, if they separated, then both Scotland and England would be entitled to 50% of the overseas assets. Now that is things like buildings, like ports, like uh, Gibraltar, for example, uh, any foreign islands that are held um, under the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, any protectorates, islands, tax havens, things like that, all would have to be split down the middle according to this uh, new evidence that's been found. And I am going to fact check it, but this is what it appears to say. 
So if this is the case, and assuming that the Scottish government knows about it, that would explain why uh, the SNP is so very keen to keep the UK in the European Union at all costs, because it means that so long as Scotland uh, leaves the UK while it's still in Europe, then we are entitled to a lot more of the United Kingdom's assets because of European Union law, because they regard Scotland and England as two countries acting together as one. They, we are not a unitary country. We are two countries in a union. And therefore, if we split, the European Union has to regard us as equals. And both member states of the EU, interestingly, because if we split, the, the UK becomes two halves. It doesn't become, you know, nine tenths and one tenth. It becomes two equal countries in the European Union's eyes. And in that circumstance, because neither country has the upper hand, the European Court of Justice and other international bodies would regard Scotland and England as equals and therefore entitled to equal shares of all foreign assets. That does not include, incidentally, the Bank of England because that's monetary um, or, or financial liquidity. That would be split uh, largely along population lines because Scotland would own approximately 10% of the Bank of England's assets. 90% would be owned by English uh, investors and savers and the English government so on because it's just more people putting more money in. So that wouldn't apply to the Bank of England, but it would apply to everything else. So if this is true, then it might explain or go some way to explaining why the SNP is so dead set on saving us from leaving the European Union because it might advantage Scotland more to leave uh, the UK while we're still European Union members. And that basically is what I have been trying to put together over the last 24 hours. I need to do a lot more research uh, into the validity of the documents that have been brought to my attention to see if this is actually true. But it suggests that... <laughs> well, sorry about that. Okay, got you the right way up again. All right, really sorry. Sometimes my phone mount tends to fall apart. I'm going to put you on my other phone mount just now. Bear with me a moment. There we go. Right, okay. Back to normal service. So, what's happened is that Scotland and England are equal, as far as we can see, in the eyes of the European Union. And therefore, uh, we should be treated equally. That puts the whole, um, the whole the whole basis of independence on a completely different footing. No longer are we just a tenth of the UK, we would be 50% of the UK. And that changes the whole dynamic of separation because it means that the assets of the entire UK would have to be split down the centre. I don't know whether this is entirely true or not. I'm only bringing it to your attention because someone else has sent me documents that show this. The documents from um, the Netherlands, the old ones from the, the, the 1800s, uh, they clearly say that the Netherlands regarded Scotland and England, even in the Union, as completely separate countries from one another. But they were in a felicitatious kind of um, joining. They, they were working together for their own joint uh, benefit. Now that, I think, is probably the best description I've ever seen of the United Kingdom. It was, and, and it should be regarded as, a, a loose uh, sort of alliance between two countries acting together in their own self-interest for their own protection, for their own uh, wealth generation, for their own security. And nothing wrong with that as far as it goes, but the conditions have changed. 300 years is a long time. And what's happening uh, due to Brexit has cast a completely different light on the relationship between the countries of Scotland and England. And maybe they cannot be in this union anymore just simply because the two nations have completely different foreign policy agendas. And I think that's probably the case. So the reasoned argument now for separation within the European Union is stronger because 
If Scotland stays in the European Union and exits the UK at the same time before Brexit happens, then according to these documents, we would be entitled under European law to 50% of the foreign assets contained inside the European Union, if you like. So everything that Britain owns inside the EU would be split down the middle, including, incidentally, Gibraltar and other potential bases around the European Union. I'm thinking of places perhaps like Malta, maybe Cyprus, Greece. There might be other places where the UK has military bases that I don't know about, perhaps in Germany and other places. Plus it would also include our, um, our, uh, our embassies as well and consulates all, all across the European Union. So it's, it, it changes things dramatically if it's true. And as I say, I need to do a little bit more digging to be able to tell you whether these, uh, these documents are genuine or not. But it does definitely change the dynamic and would explain a lot about why the SNP is so desperately keen to keep us in the EU. Apart from anything else, I guess, that if we exit while we're still inside the EU, then both England and Scotland would still have to be treated as members of the EU, because neither would be a successor state. They would both be successor states, and they would both inherit the mantle of still being in the European Union, because Scotland, let's say Scotland separates first before we leave. Scotland separates first, and it's already said it wishes to remain in the EU, the European Union will just keep hold of us. England, on the other hand, if it leaves, uh, if it separates from Scotland before Brexit, England then becomes a loose cannon. You know, it wants to leave the European Union, and it no longer has Scotland to hold it back. So therefore, it's far easier for England to separate from the European Union if we are no longer in that in that equation. It's no longer a three-sided equation. It's just between England and the EU then. So there are benefits to Brexiteers from Scotland leaving the UK before Brexit happens. Anyway, that's about it. It's a hard situation to quantify and explain in any detail, but the historic documents appear to suggest that the Europeans view us as two countries, not just one. But up until now, they have had to deal with just the one entity because the UK is the thing that has been representing both Scotland and England. Anyway, that's about it for now. I'm going home for my tea. Hopefully uh, it was worth the wait today and I'll see you all tomorrow. All right, have a great day. Bye for now.